to start talking about the psychologist Carl Jung. Um, I should just say that uh, there is a piece that it sounds like you guys didn't get any of, which was the psychosexual stages. Is that right? Okay, so that is uh, uploaded as a video. So just make sure you get that because it sounds like you guys didn't uh, get any of that lecture in person. Okay, who's heard of uh, who's heard of Carl Jung? psychology. So, uh, Carl Jung was a contemporary of uh, Freud's. <clears throat> a lot of people misinterpret their relationship to think that Carl Jung was sort of a student uh, of Freud's. It is true that Freud had more notoriety and more fame. He was uh, better known than was Carl Jung at the time. But where Freud was trained as a physician, he was trained as a psychiatrist, which at the time was really more like a neurologist or even a brain surgeon. <clears throat> so when we think about a psychiatrist today, we think about they're gonna be treating those mental disorders, but maybe with some type of medication, but also maybe with some type of therapy. <clears throat> at the time, again, when Freud was coming up in psychiatry, it was really more about lobotomies and really more about uh, locking you in padded rooms, right? So there wasn't this, again, real sense of psychology as something that you could talk someone out of, right? That you could give some type of treatment in terms of therapy or group therapy or something else, even medication at the time. <clears throat> and so, again, Freud's really trained as a practitioner, but Jung was trained as a scientist. And again, psychology isn't really a thing yet. I mean, it, it's coming up, but, but really we're thinking more about psychiatry on the one end and on a further end, almost philosophy. There's also this piece where they're coming together and making a bit of a science of psychology, but that hasn't quite yet connected with the clinical applications of psychology. In fact, most scientific psychologists around this time thought that the clinical practice of psychology was a waste of time. That we're really just interested in understanding the mind. You folks laboring to treat actual people, that's ridiculous, that's a waste of my time. We wanna understand the human experience, right? This really high-minded, right? the way that scientists are sometimes described, this really high-minded sense of psychology rather than on the ground where we can actually help people. <clears throat> so again, Carl Jung comes out of a, of a scientific background. Freud comes out of a more medical background. <clears throat> and Freud actually call, calls on Jung because he wants Jung's scientific expertise to back up his theories, right? Because Freud is more of a practitioner, he doesn't necessarily have a scientific background to prove the things that he's saying, to develop any type of research study, to give evidence to the things that he's theorizing. So he seeks out somebody who has the scientific background, who can give some legitimacy <clears throat> to his theories, and he finds Carl Jung. Now, again, they were contemporaries. They were both scientists, if you want to call Freud a scientist, in their own right. It wasn't like Freud taught Jung everything he knew. <clears throat> They did exchange ideas, and Freud did teach Jung some things, or at least give Jung some impressions that he used to form his, his own ideas. <clears throat> One of them, of course, being the idea of the unconscious. And so we've been talking about this, of course, right? this idea that this is this hidden part, this sleeping part, this unavailable part of your mind. And uh, F Freud, excuse me, Jung bought into this. Jung says, yeah, I've done some clinical work myself. Now, when Jung was doing clinical work, he was kind of counting people, right? He's doing this science to his clinical work. Uh, and he says, you know, when I'm seeing folks in my clinical work, I'm also seeing that they have this part of themselves that they don't know about. 
is real foundation for psychoanalytic theory. This idea of the unconscious that's fed by past experiences. <clears throat> what did Freud think was going on in the unconscious? What did Freud think even was the purpose of the unconscious? Yeah. I mean, there's like your more primal thoughts, but also like deep rooted desires that you may or may not be able to comprehend or under your awareness. Sure. So there's the content, right? That's what's in the unconscious, but what's the purpose of it? What's the purpose? Yes, sir. Survive and reproduce. Survive and reproduce. That's the content still. That's what's in there. Why do we have it? Why isn't this just available to us? Kill that kid for his food. Yeah. Just like your um, your personality, basically, like just going right from wrong. Okay. I think you're thinking of the super ego. The way it remembers this, the purpose. You guys haven't seen the psychosexual stages le lecture yet. Maybe some of you have. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but I don't know the answer. To okay, well, what would it be like if you figured out that, in fact, the reason that you like this girl, the reason that you like this girlfriend is because she really reminds you of your mom. And that's kind of hot. Is that something you want to carry around in your head? <laughs> no. Every time you see somebody hot? It's just like that. So what's the purpose? Yes, sir. Maximize comfort and pleasure. To maximize your comfort, right? To make you feel good about yourself. For Freud, this meant that everything in the subconscious, excuse me, everything in the unconscious, were things that were just unpalatable to us, things that we didn't want to know about ourselves, that we were violent, that we were sexual, that we would kill our dad, that we would sleep with our moms, that our sister is really our type, right? All of this stuff that's a little embarrassing, a little uncomfortable, if you had to know this about yourself and really realize it, including all the other stuff I'm not naming that's personal to you, right? You, you might not like yourself very much. And so the point of the unconscious in Freud's view was really just to hide all this stuff from you. In fact, he would say that everything in the unconscious, this is Freud, he would say that everything in the unconscious is negative is violent, is sexual, is disgusting. Jung took a different approach. So again, they're sort of sharing ideas, but Jung differs from Freud here. <clears throat> Jung doesn't think that the unconscious only holds these things. He would say, yeah, it does hold that type of thing. It does hold that aggressive, violent piece of ourselves. But there's other stuff in there too. There's breathing in there. There's how to eat. There's how to love. There's what it means to have a leader. There's what it means to have children. So Jung thought, first of all, again, that everything wasn't negative and that there would just be parts of ourselves that we just didn't know or weren't paying attention to that are better taken care of by some unconscious process or processes that this was made up of, again, of our individual experiences. <clears throat> but he also believed in something he called, and this is all still young, the collective unconscious. Anybody heard of this? So the collective unconscious is, it's a, a, an, a part of our unconscious that is shared by all humans. That's what the collective piece means. That this part of our unconscious is not unique from person to person, that all humans share in this unconscious. That there's some part of our mind that is identical, if not connected, but we'll stick with identical, that is an identical in every human. Most every human, probably. Who knows? Here's how he 
describes them. So here's uh, Jung's description. By the way, pronounced Jung. I will just keep saying it Jung, but just to teach you. Jung. Uh, so here's his description of the collective unconscious. He says, my thesis then is as follows. In addition to our immediate consciousness, which is of a thoroughly personal nature, in which we believe to be the only empirical psyche. So he says, in addition to our immediate consciousness, in addition to our consciousness, which is of a thoroughly personal nature, right? That the things that are conscious to us, and you can even add here Freud's idea of the unconscious, right? That that's really personal, that's yours, that's who you are. We are still talking about personality. Which is of a thoroughly personal nature, please don't try to write this. <laughs> that's, I'm not gonna read it that slow. I'm just reading it for you to understand. Which is of a thoroughly personal nature in which we believe to be the only empirical psyche. What does empirical mean? What's empirical mean? Empirical means provable, right? Again, this is what he was signed on for. So empirical means that we've tested it and it's proven versus theoretical, which means we think that's what's gonna happen. So which is of a thoroughly personal nature in which we believe to be the only provable empirical psyche, even if we lack, excuse me, even if we tack on the personal unconscious as an appendix. So here he's saying, right, you've got this personal conscious mind, you've got this personal unconscious mind that you can add on. So in addition to this, there exists a second psychic system of a collective, universal, and in personal nature, which is identical in all individuals. There's a second psychic system of a collective, universal, and identical nature in all individuals. This collective unconscious does not develop individually, this is important, but is inherited. Hold that in your head, but is inherited. It consists of pre-existent forms, we'll figure out what that means. That is to say the archetypes, pre-existent forms that he's calling the archetypes, which can only become conscious secondarily. See what that means. And which give definite form to certain psychic contexts. Will you tell me what you understood from that? Yes, sir. Okay, so there's this inherited piece that seems to be hereditary, very good. That's how it gets there. How about what it is, or what's in there? Let's hear from that. What do you get? Okay, so he's actually saying, in addition to this personal part, right? So he's describing something that's different than personal that is in the collective. So he says something about these things called pre-existent forms or archetypes. Archetypes. Check if there's not an E in there. Oh. Um, archetypes. So archetypes are like these things that we just, as humans, seem to know about. In addition to knowing about them, we have a whole collection of ideas that goes with this idea, this archetype, that is probably shared across humanity. That if you found someone in Zimbabwe, or Thailand, or New Zealand, Greenland, wherever, and you ask them to describe, let's do an easy one, mother, what
what sorts of things do we associate with mother that you think are universal? Nurture. What's that? Nurture. Nurture. Very good. What else? Mother. What you got? Caregiver. Caregiver. Okay. What else? Yes, ma'am. Mother. Say something else. <laughs> no, come on. Mother, you don't have any ideas about what it, what a mother is? Describe your mother. What's she like? Um, nurture, caregiver. <laughs> and that's it? Um, let me think for a minute. Is she a man or a woman? A woman. Oh, okay. so there's one you know. What else? Mother. Yes, sir. And what? So I might call on you. <laughs> Have an answer in your head. Yes, sir. Okay, so protector, good. Protector, you can figure it out. What else? Yes, sir. Uh, child bearer. Child bearer, good. What else? Yes, sir. Stress. Stress? <laughs> Say more. <laughs> about. So your mom stresses you out? Is that what you mean? How else can we say that? I, I think that is something. But how else? What? Why does she stress you out? How does she stress you out? I don't know. I just dealt with like a lot of mental and physical abuse in life, so it kind of just wore on me. So potentially ab abusive. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but we could maybe say that. I'm sorry to use this, but I think it's helpful. I can't spell. We'll come back to this. What else? Yes, sir. Typically organizer or gives orders. Okay. Organizer. What else? Yes, ma'am. Seem like a role model. Role model. Very good. Couple more. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in charge, okay. In charge of anything in particular. Gosh. What's mom in charge of? Like for sure. <clears throat> What's mom in charge of? Yeah. Uh, family. The family, right? Maybe the household. Yeah. Is that fit for most folks? Just this idea. Okay, so here's the thing, right? Do you think if we took somebody who was from a different country or we took somebody who was born in 1850 in Kansas City, Missouri, and we described this and didn't tell them what it was or vice versa, gave them the word mother and asked them to describe mother, do you think they would come up with some similar themes? Do you think they would come up with some similar ideas around mother? So this is what Jung's talking about, right? This idea of an archetype. This idea that you don't have to learn what mother means, right? Even if you can't quite put words to it when you're born, you project this onto the person that's holding you and feeding you and probably reared you, right? But even if nobody taught you what that means, that you get a sense of this relationship. Well, how do we even know this? Well, we can see it in other animals, right? Not all of them, lizards, probably not, but from birds, 
to mammals, we can see this relationship. But they do all of these things. So even if, even if, first of all, you can moderate some of these. So you could, for instance, here's another argument. That's similar to mode, but now we have a whole other set of ideas. Whether or not that is true of your mother or your stepmother, right? You you know what type of things go here, and whether or not this is descriptive of your mother, you know what type of things go here and flipped over. If you have a mother you know what type of things she's supposed to do. Such that even if you don't have a mother who lives up to the archetype, it will be somewhat stark to you that she's not living up to that archetype because you have this inborn sense of what it means to be a mother. Such that if she's, you know, no, no mom's perfect, right? but if she's none of these things, you're going to feel that, that too. Does this make sense? Let's do one more. Because here's the thing, oh, uh, here's the thing that we all have, probably. Well, we definitely. Me, body, clone. Okay. So we all have a mom. Here's something none of us probably have. He's a king. Right? But I'm willing to bet we can still make a list of what a king he is or is supposed to be. What you got? The ruler, and then he's also like ruling. Okay, the ruler. What else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so power, good. You ready? Well, I thought you were going to give me the easy one. <laughs> I thought about it for a long time. Good. The decision maker, what else? Yes, ma'am. The king is a man. Say, say what? The king is a man. The king is a man, good. What else? Rich. Good. I want to modify something. Okay, so that's good. What about this? Good king. Yes, ma'am. Trustworthy. What's that? Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Very good. What else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, maybe role model, is that okay? <clears throat> yes, sir? Makes like a, like a communal decision, like allows other people to like play their own, I guess. How about um, seeks Listen. input? Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, yes, sir? Respected. Say again? Respected. Respected, very good. Yes, ma'am. See you. Honest. Honest. We're good. Yes, ma'am. Understanding. Understanding. One more. Yes, sir. Beloved. Say again. Beloved. 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 Very good. So easy, that was easier than mom, okay? But it was easy for you all to come up with this idea of what it means to be a king and even what it means to be a good king. I suppose I could have wrote bad king and you could have done it. Or another way to say bad king is tyrant and you could have done it. 
right? Even though we don't have a king, so the important thing, this other important thing about archetypes is that sometimes they don't maintain their name. But the fact that they're archetypes almost means that as humans, we, we want to do them if we don't have to. So we tend to will want a king, even if we don't have to have one. And in some cases, we have to have one. But who, who's to stand in for our king? There's a couple answers here. Yeah. Uh, answer how you want. Okay, the president is a stand in for our king, right? He's the ruler, he's got power, he makes decisions, he's a man, and he is indeed rich. Right? Yeah? What did you say? Could it be your father? Could it be your father? Do these fit for father? and resources, right, is, is what that parallel would be in terms of father. But he's in charge, at least on paper, right? He, family takes his name usually, these two things, right? He is maybe making some of the decisions in the family. Of course, we understand that the mother, this is why I sort of specified this, is often in charge of more household things, but the dad may decide, I mean, these are all stereotypes, of course, but the dad may traditionally be more deciding you know what type of work or how much income the family is going to have when they're going to take vacation or something like that and then of course is a man and is a provider rich in resources a good dad this fit for good dad is trustworthy is a role model seeks input from the rest of the family certainly mom right maybe kids where would you like to go on vacation instead of staying another two weeks in the Las Vegas hotel? <laughs> Seeks input, and is respected, is honest, is understanding, and of course is loved by his family. So there are some ways in which even if we don't have this exact archetype, if we don't have a king, that we still, we still get it. We still get king. We still get the leader of the tribe, right? This might be the captain of the football team. This might be the coach, right? There's a lot of ways in which you will see this idea of what I'm calling king, but really it's just this leader, or the male leader at least, right? That re show up, that show up over and over again um, in our life, in our culture. We could do this with a lot of things. We could do this with God. We could do this with hope. We could do this with love. We could do this with child, we could do this with sister, right? That there are all of these things that we just seem to know about, walking, communication, talking. How do we get these? Is, the, is it this magical thing? Is it this magical way in which we are sort of all connected to each other? Is that how we all understand king or mother? Yep. Sure. Yeah. So that is that is exactly counter to Young's point, right? That yeah. you he would say that you did not have to learn it. That you might not have knew the name King, but when you looked to your dad, you knew this is what you're supposed to be doing, whether or not he's doing it. Same with right your mom. Yeah. It's one of the first words you learn, so you knew the word, but here you might not have, but you knew the idea. Where do you learn this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think you learn from like watching the people around you. Like I don't think you just know it. I think if you like see your dad and you, you say he's someone that's in power with you, then you learn what he's like and that's how you like know what a king to be like. Okay, so you're still saying it's learned. Yeah, I think so. Let's imagine that it's not learned. What are some ways in which it could not be learned? Is it this magical Connection. Yes. I think it is connected. I mean, that's what, like what we're talking about. Is that it's a universal thing, 
and like comparing it to like bees, like how do they know that one is the queen bee? Like, They're good. That's like a psychological thing that we all have ingrained in us. Like it's we can't just point it out though. Like that's the point is that you can't point it out. Right. Because we don't know. Well. Why did we know? But like we didn't decide. We just have ingrained inside of us. That's right. And and I will say this is important because in Young's time he certainly didn't know. He, he would have been in his right mind to think it is some magical, spiritual thing connecting us. And you can think of it this way. But we have science today. And he even leaves a hint in his description as to where to look. You called on it earlier. <laughs> can you imagine calling Donald Trump and asking him to tell us where our text is? No. Okay, so he says the collective unconscious does not develop individually but is inherited. Where does this suggest we get these inborn a priori, if you're a philosophy student, where do we get these ideas? Specifically. Specifically. That's it, right? These are just what? These are just what? That's any point that. What are if they're genetic, what are they? What's another way to think about archetypes? What's something else that you're born with that you just know how to do? What do we call them? Instincts. Call these instincts, right? It's the same. These are just instincts. And we tend to think of instincts as reactionary, right? You do this, I have an instinct to do that back. But instincts are also projective, right? They also sort of shape our expectations. And so what Jung is really describing when he's talking about archetypes is just this idea, this, it's a type of instinct. It's a type of thing that you just got genetically and of course you have to figure out pretty quickly. Imagine if you're born and you're a child, and this woman is starting, picks you up and tries to feed you, and you have no clue what a mother is. This is a stranger, right? Oh. But you don't have that. That's not your instinct. Your instinct is to look for the woman who is gonna do this stuff, rather than to be fearful. You go towards it because you have this instinct, you have this archetype of mother, of the relationship, of being a child. Questions about archetypes? So a good idea for thought paper, if you're looking for those, <clears throat> Um, might be to think up some other archetypes. Sort of talk about what those archetypes might be. These are some pretty easy ones. Basically, king, queen, mother, father. All right, by the way, we didn't say that, but this could also be a queen archetype, of course. So if you are looking for a thought paper, what are some other ones? Home, food, what other stuff do we just seem to know about? And the better way to check for it is instead of, hey, did we just know this at birth, is to think how universal is this across time and across culture? Something's universal across time and culture, right? It, it probably stands to reason that it is just human. It is just something that we do no matter when or where we were born. Okay, questions? Awesome. Let's talk about... Jungian typology and the Myers Briggs. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time uh, studying and researching uh, Jung's typology theories. 
Uh, it's one of the reasons I had you all take that personality test on, on the first day of class. Uh, it's because I think it helps me know you better. In uh, usual semesters, and the room is packed, it could probably still work in here, but it's probably not enough to make it, uh, make it interesting. I tend to split people up by type, right, and sort of make you sit with people of your same type. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but it is interesting to see when a section of a room agrees or disagrees with another section of the room uh, by personality. <clears throat> so um, let's start with just the Myers-Briggs. This has some depth to it that I, that I feel, always feel the need to kind of go into, um, though we often run out of time. So um, I'm just going to give you what I can give you, and I, I may go off on tangent, so that's not a new one. So the Myers-Briggs gives you four sets of letters. In this first spot, you're going to have an E or an I. In the second spot, you're going to have an N or an S. In the third spot, you're going to have a T or an F. And then in the fourth spot, you're going to have a J or a P. So what do all these things mean? What does uh, E stand for? Who knows this? Very good. It stands for extrovert. And the I, of course, good, introvert. Introverts were a lot quieter in answer. How about the uh, S? Anybody know? Nope, stands for sensing. The N stands for intuition. Thinking, F, feeling, the P is perceiving, and the J is judging. So Myers-Briggs is what we call a type theorem. There's a difference between what we call trait and type personality theorems. Have I talked about this? So in a trait theory, in a trait theory, we'll maybe talk about one of these by next class. In a trait theory, we're really looking at what traits you have. What are the components that make up your personality? That is to say, if you're an extrovert, that's not a good one, uh, if you are an open person, if you're the type of person who's open-minded, if this is a trait that we have, well, the trait is really just interested in how much open-mindedness you have, right? It's just saying you're not very open-minded at all, or you're moderately open-minded, or you're very open-minded. Right? So it's going to usually give you this range of an amount of a trait that you have. In some trait theories, no, I'll say that. So it's going to give you a range in terms of the amount of a trait that you have. A type theory, on the other hand, a type theory wants to place you in a specific type. You are this type. You are that type. So the Jungian typology theory and the Myers-Briggs are type theories, right? If you are an INFP, that's your type. You can also think of it like if you are an introvert, 
that's your type. If you're a feeler, that's your type. You're a feeling type. You're a perceiving type, right? And so uh, Myers-Briggs and Jungian typology are what we call type theories, right? They are interested in putting you in a box, so to speak. What you have to understand about the Myers-Briggs in particular is that even though it's gonna say that you're one of these, even though it's gonna call you an extrovert, that doesn't mean that you don't have some qualities about you or some times when you are introverted or when you have introverted thought patterns or behaviors or feelings, etc. Same if you're a thinker, that doesn't mean you don't have feelings. That doesn't mean that there are times when your emotions get tapped or when you do something out of the kindness of your heart, right? So it is important to know that even though you're placed in a type on this type theory, that does not mean that you don't have the other piece of the puzzle. It just means you have more of this piece of the puzzle. Or said more precisely, you tend to be extroverted. Or you tend to make decisions with your thinking, with your logical mind, versus your feeling or emotional does that make sense so far? So let's begin to break down what each of these things is talking about. So what's your understanding of the difference between an introvert and an extrovert? What's your understanding of that? Yes, ma'am. So somebody who's outgoing is the extrovert versus somebody who stays to themselves is the introvert. Okay, good. Yes, ma'am? In the pink? I was just gonna say the same thing. Same, okay. Yes, ma'am? An extrovert is someone who like gets energy off of other people, and then an introvert, when they're around a lot of people, they like drain their energy. Okay. And so they like regain their energy in the next time. Okay, so this idea of getting or kind of draining energy in one situation versus the other, that's one that we do commonly hear. And both of these things are not untrue, and both of these things are related to what this true meaning is. The idea of introvert and extrovert, again, came from Carl Jung. And what he's really pointing out here is where do you spend most of your psychological time? Not what do you necessarily prefer to do, or how you act, but psychologically, where do you tend to be? Extroverts tend to be in the real world, with the stuff in front of them. And even if they're not with the stuff, and they're in their mind, they're in their mind thinking about the stuff, right? They can't escape I would call real life. Okay? Now, if you're an extrovert, you might be thinking, what the hell else is there to pay attention to? Like, there's the world, and where's an introvert? Of course. Thank you. Great. Where else can you be if not in the real world? Where can you be? Are you writing it down? Tell you after. Yeah, thanks. Because I don't know, I'm just usually like almost me, like I'm just in my head a lot. I'm just thinking a lot. I'm like, yeah, I'm here, I'm doing this, or like how I'm interacting with someone. And like, that kind of stuff. Very good. So he's in his head. This is where introverts tend to spend most of their time, is, is in their heads or in their feelings or in their ideas, whatever you want to call them. They tend to be more in here, less so out here. Yes, sir? So I kind of struggle with the types of theories. Sure. Because um, as much as I am extroverted, those outside factors really cause me to think so much, which would be kind of, I guess, equivalent to the introverted. Is this you? 
Yeah, okay. yeah, you and I. Are so, yeah. yeah, this is how I know this about you. Um, in in P types, in particular, in F P types, uh, in particular, when paired with extroversion, and when we get to intuition, you'll see this. We don't quite like we're in the world, but we're not. You're not really paying attention to it. You're like watching it and thinking about what it's really. And so there's this way in which you're checked in, but you're checked out. And so what happens is this, that these types, ENTPs are, are sort of like this too, where you need to process what, what went on. And so often ENFPs and often um, ENTPs will argue, but uh, are called the most introverted extroverts. So you're right on target <laughs> in terms of you, you do like to socialize, you do like to interact, you are curious generally about people and things, but you also sometimes say, get out, I hate you. <laughs> I need some time. Is that right? So there's this difference, right? Where do I spend my psychological time? Am I paying attention to the world? Am I checked in to here? Or am I more reflected? Am I more considered or wondering? Okay. Here's this difference um, between the in introvert and the extrovert. Any questions about this? I study Buddhism a little bit, and uh, they have, these are not spelled right. <laughs> and they have these words, uh, tata and then chita. And tata just means that. They, they sometimes say, Ta ta ta, which means thatness. The thatness. And so this is extroverts are in the thatness, into the stuff. And chita is your mind. And so Buddhists sort of recognize this duality of the external world and the internal world. And Jung happened to land on that same idea of a mind too, right? That we have these two places that our mind can be. And Young is noting that some people go one way more often and other folks go the other way. <clears throat> now the idea about gaining energy uh, or tending to have more interest in reading or hanging out by yourself versus going to a party or whatever it is, <clears throat> is because for the introvert, because they sort of automatically flip inward, because that's their first step, that's where they start. It means that if you take them to a party, they've got to do a little work to get out of themselves. It's not necessarily like hard work, but it's, it's unnatural, right? And so they may be having the best time of their life, but eventually that's probably tiring. Eventually sort of pushing yourself outward this way is going to drain you, and you're going to say, i got to go home. Or at least I gotta go sit over there and don't talk to me. Right? Versus if you're an extrovert, and I say, today, class, I'm gonna have you come in, and I just want you to do an hour long journal entry. Okay? Is everybody cool with that? The extroverts are gonna fuck, man. <laughs> they're gonna be on their phones, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna try to distract themselves from just having to be in their mind for an hour. Right? The introverts are gonna have a bit of an easier time with that. They're going to have an easier time of just saying, okay, let's see what's going on in my head today. Does this make sense, this distinction, right? Such that, again, for the introvert to pull himself inward, that takes a little bit of energy, and eventually that's going to get taxing, and then vice versa. Question. So, sensing and intuition. So one thing you kind of have to know to put this puzzle together is that these are the perceiving traits and that these are the judging traits. Okay, here. Such that well, I like to think about the human mind, and you'll hear me make this analogy a few times, 
But I like to think of the human mind like a computer, because we're basically building a human mind. Big fan of Westworld. Anybody? No. So there's two broad processes that a computer can do. Broad, broad process. <laughs> Who can take a guess at what those broad processes are? It does two things total. To really? Are you just worry about me calling on you? That's what happens. They're basically input and output. Right? These two super broad processes. You can put something in the computer, you can type things into it, you can send a message, you can put in a formula, whatever. And the computer can give you information, it can process that information, it can send the email, whatever it is. It can do two things. It can take things into itself, and it can put things out of itself. Our mind is the same. The perceiving functions designate the ways in which we prefer to take information in. The way, if you will, that we pay attention. Where the judging functions decide, excuse me, denote how we make decisions. How we judge what we perceive. How we decide what it is that is happening. Or decide what it is that we need to do. How we judge what should go on is what judging means. It doesn't mean judgy in the sense of evaluating or critiquing. It really just means coming to a judgment. Coming to a decision is what I would mean. And so when we look at these perceptive functions, what we're interested in is how does this individual, how does the individual of this type take in information? How do they see the world? What are they paying attention to? Um, who's an S type? Who's an SP type in particular? Who remembers that? Guys, go back and look at these things. SP. Yeah. Very good. All right. So, what's describe? What is this? Okay. I mean, tell me about it. Okay. You pull it down and project something onto it. Yeah. Very good. Uh, who's an N? P type. What is this? Tell me about this thing. Okay, tell me about it. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Who do you got this project? I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of stuck thinking about what they said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, your intuition powers are not very strong this morning, I understand. Here's, here's, what, here's the difference. What I was trying to draw out, I didn't have this, usually. The sensor will usually say something like, it's a projector. Okay, tell me about it. Well, it's white, it's made out of this thing, it's got a rolly silver thing, and there's a rope on it. And I'll ask the intuitive, what is this? It's a projector. Tell me about it. Well, you project things on it. It can be used to show things in class. Sometimes it gets in your way when you start the, when you start the beginning of uh, our lecture for today. Right? The difference is that the sensor is going to tend to pay attention to the very literal things that are in front of them. The very sensations is why it's called that. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? That the sensor is going to be very tuned in to the literal dynamics of whatever the object is in front of them that they're gonna see it for what it is. That they're gonna see it for exactly what it is and nothing else. Whereas the intuitive is gonna miss all that, usually. They're gonna say, yeah, everybody knows that. Everybody can see it's white. But what does it do? Intuition basically means reading between the lines. These are the folks who are going to pay more attention to what isn't there than what is there. 
These are the folks who like to speculate and dig in and be curious and ask questions and know more. And in some cases, know less so that they can find out more. One thing I heard as a difference between sensors and intuitives, tell me if, it, if this fits for you, is that sensors want to know every detail to be sure that they understand. Tell me again. Okay, you, you said that when I get to the, I'm going to see, okay, one more time, what was that number? Whereas intuitives almost hate getting all of the information. That there's this distaste for, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. You don't have to tell me again. Or, yeah, yeah, I get it. You don't have to tell me exactly what I'm going to see when I get to that corner. I heard it's in that direction. I'll see it if I keep going. They'll get lost. But they prefer it that way, right? There's something about the adventure of that curiosity of figuring, out, figuring it out for yourself versus knowing exactly what's going to happen. Sensors like that security. And intuitives like that adventure. They like that sense of, we want to get lost. That'd be cool. Does this ring true for anybody? Anybody an intuitive who's like, yeah, I hate it when people tell me all of the information. Is that true for you? Anybody a sensor and feel like, like I'm not going to make a move on it unless I know exactly what it is that I need to know. Is that true for you? Whenever I get to somebody in the class who's asking me 10 months in advance for, well, yeah, it is, they will, they will email me before this semester uh, in advance about a test or a paper that I probably haven't even thought about yet. And I can tell they're usually NS tyrants. They want to know. They don't want to get it wrong. Like they want to know exactly. And so again, sensors are the ones that are going to tend to look directly at things, and intuitives are going to be the ones to look past things. I often give this example in class of, let's say you've got a couple, one's a sensor and one's an intuitive, and they're house shopping. And they drive past a house that's an old two, three-story Victorian house, big, I don't know how to describe houses, but big windows. It's got a huge yard. Um, but it's really run down. It's dilapidated, the paint's coming off, the, sh the roof's gonna need replacing. Um, maybe there's some floorboard damage or something inside the house. What's the difference based on this description I've given you of intuitives and sensors? How might you expect them to differ in terms of how they evaluate this house? Yes, sir. I think the intuitive may like look past all the run-down parts and just think, man, that, that was an awesome house at one point, or that could be an awesome house if I fix it up, and then the uh, sensor would probably be like, oh my gosh, that'd be so much work to fix that thing up, it's just a junk house. Very good, right? But the intuitive, and you know, this is just a stereotype if you want, but the intuitive is going to say, wow, look how beautiful this house could be, or look how beautiful this house was. Can you imagine it when we painted and we put the new blah, blah, blah? You can see our little kids running in there, right? They're going to be able to sort of see what isn't there yet, what could be there. But the sensor is going to see the peeling paint and the shitty roof and all of the money that it's going to take to put those things back into place, right? And so they're going to tend to just see the world differently. Um, the last thing I'll just say about these two is you know, there is a little bit of um, theory, I guess, about what types of relationships these types tend to be in. And it turns out that this seems to be the most important letter in terms of relationships. Not just romantic relationships, but just friendships even, working relationships. Uh, because it dictates, again, how you see the world. And if you see the world in, in sort of fundamentally different ways, if you're looking at and for different things, it can often, it's not like you're not going to like each other or you're going to hate each other, but you're just going to be like, I don't know, he kind of never gets what I'm talking about. Or, I don't know, he's always on about some weird project that's never going to happen. Right? And there's just going to be uh, oftentimes this kind of miss. Now, that's not set in stone, but 
of all of the letters in terms of setting up relationships, uh, this tends to be the most predictive in terms of whether the two are uh, well connected. Questions for me? Okay, so um, on Thursday, I'll probably start at least this part of the lecture over uh, so that we can get uh, through these last two. And then I may talk some other stuff about uh, the Myers Briggs type and then maybe some other personality theories briefly. Uh, so look for that lecture on Thursday. Um, also look for an email about your test. It will probably be next week sometime. Okay?